So welcome and thank you for joining us today. The purpose of this roundtable is to consider the needs and opportunities that lie before us. Today, you will be hearing from some district leaders, seven leaders from the US and Canada, a variety of positions, psychologists, superintendents, director of special ed, and associate superintendents, and they'll be sharing with you some of their innovative ideas for what to do with stimulus funds or other funds and what we can do to support youth as they go back to school this fall. You'll also be hearing from a group, the members of the Strategic Alliance Task Force of the Coalition for the Future of Education. We have been meeting almost weekly for three or four months as we consider the future of education and what we can do to help us move from where we are to a better future. We know that there's a huge influx of stimulus and other funds, and we're really curious about how they're being spent. Are the monies being spent wisely? Are they being spent in such a way that will be sustainable, that will lead to the best outcomes? Our group today will help us consider some of the ins and outs of what to do with these monies. You know, we are most concerned about children's trauma. Consider Matt. Matt was a student who struggled before COVID, but during COVID, he fell way behind academically, but it wasn't only in terms of academics that he experienced trauma and stress. His self-esteem shrunk. He felt a sense of loneliness. He missed his friends, and he didn't know what to do with this new routine of sitting in front of a computer. It was a very hard time for Matt. We know that there are thousands of students like Matt or Katie or Jorge, many students who have struggled. And we are wondering what will be best for them as they return to school this fall. So Jesse, thinking about your work with the campaign for trauma-informed policy and practice, what thoughts do you have for us? Thanks, Chris. Uh, like you said, um, the coronavirus did not create the need for trauma-informed, healing-centered, and resilience-focused practices, especially not in the education system, but it certainly did exacerbate the need for it. The amount of stress and adversity that has been experienced by students and staff and other school personnel alike throughout the past 18 months has been overwhelming, and our systems need to be prepared for when people come back to school in the fall. Fortunately, the, the uh, elementary and secondary school emergency relief funding in the American Rescue Plan Act, as well as CARES Act, provided, provides the opportunity to put in place systems level reforms to address those cycle, the psychosocial, emotional, and spiritual needs of staff and students. We know that we do need to address the needs of staff and help them process because we know that dysregulated adults cannot help regulate dysregulated children. And so in terms of moving back into the classrooms, we really need to help uh, support staff and teachers and to develop a collective and shared responsibility across the school environment to move toward trauma-informed schools because we don't have enough counselors and there is not money to sustain the treatment option for all students who become dysregulated. But we know that we can move toward a systems-based approach and a systems level approach to creating safe environments for everybody in the school environment. Where the National Trauma Campaign is most interested in this is to see what funds are leveraged to support the mental health dollars by creating trauma-informed environments in schools and then leveraging that to support the ongoing investment in creating trauma-informed school environments across the world. We want to, we know that this is not just one-time funding. The, the American Rescue Plan Act certainly is, but if there are successes that come from that, and if uh, dollars are spent strategically and wisely, we can advocate and grow from that to ensure that more money continues to be put in 
to address these deeper needs in school environments to support all students and all staff to reach their fullest potential, which is why we're all on this call and what we all want to do. So I thank you all very much for being here. And again, I know that Melissa will get more deep into the neuroscience and as will Hannah and Tamara and others, the needs for creating again, trauma informed resilience focused and healing centered environments within our schools. I would like to take a moment to introduce our first uh, speaker is Donna Manuelito, uh, who is the Assistant Superintendent of Academic Excellence, uh, Curriculum Instruction, Assessment, uh, Professional Development and Technology at the San Carlos Unified School District. I want to start off by saying I am half Navajo. I grew up on the Navajo Reservation, so I do know what historical trauma is intergenerational trauma but what we're going to start with is the trauma-informed initiative once you start getting into this you need to start with the why so our why's was attendance rate discipline rate graduation rate higher education staff morale there was no systems in place even the cleanliness of the schools the reports and academics so, so social and emotional versus academic learning most schools focus solely on academic learning, but it is one of the worst ways for us to look at it with trauma. Supporting children socially and emotionally first is the key to academic improvement. And we saw this with San Carlos because in Arizona, San Carlos Unified School District was the lowest of all districts year after year. We actually challenged the State Department for our high school and they went from an F to a C school. And we are right on the border of getting to the getting over that hump when um, the pandemic happened. We have community partnerships. Within these the, um, partnerships, they contribute to our schools. So our wellness center, they provide us with um, behavior technicians. Um, our San Carlos Apache College, they provide us with our high school to take dual credits. The forestry works with our science departments on making cultural relevant um, teaching. We have the um, University of Arizona Cooperative Extension. And our parent educators, this is funded through the, this program. And what they provide is parenting classes, community outreach, they teach classes in fatherhood is sacred, motherhood is sacred, linking generations by strengthening relationships. They have a San Carlos Apache parenting curriculum. Um, they address family violence and abuse community programs, and they're they are all ACES certified trainers through Arizona. So our parent educators is the ones that we really spotlight on this because they're the grassroots people. They're the ones that know the community. They're the ones that can tell us what's going on in the communities and how we can help them. Thank you. This is from San Carlos Unified School District. So next up is Dr. Rachel Santa. She's a director of special education in Cumberland, Rhode Island. Rachel and I have worked together for the last three or four years. She's been a member of the Childhood Trauma Learning Collaborative, a group in New England that's working particularly on mental health concerns. Rachel. So, the um, department is a urban a school district. They are the lowest funded in the entire state of Rhode Island. Um, but despite that, I feel like we provide um, some really wonderful services. And one of the highlights is that we are a pre K through high school PBIS model school, meaning that they had to get over 85% of adult support in which to do that. From that, we built upon it. And when we talk about compassionate schools, we know that we have the obligation to use evidence-based practices to strengthen student mental health and well-being. So we implemented um, a universal uh, district-wide target team, which looks at students' mental health and, um, support and behavioral health support. Uh, this coming year, we're using our ESSER funds to fund a, um, a universal screening tool very comparable to uh, academic screening tools that district use. A lot of academic ones would be like the STAR assessment or maybe a NOSTAR. This built to um, screening for students with social emotional difficulties. 
So two times a year, a teacher does the assessment um, or the screening, I should say. And then if the student can read, the student also can do the screening. And from those results, it disaggregates into tiers. And then our teams can look at those tiers of support and start providing both universal and targeted lessons. Um, the system also helps us with uh, providing some suggestions for interventions, but it's not limited to canned interventions. We have the ability to add our own. Um, because many of our schools, one of my schools is a conscious discipline school, one of our other ones really um, has embraced zones of regulation and, and things like that. You know, I, I, I kind of laugh with, with Chris saying, I'm not sure how innovative they are, but those are some techniques we're trying and how we're supporting and the funds are being used to support uh, those programs. So what I'm hearing is that we are seeing different ways of being flexible partnering with parents, wraparound services. What can we do to support the mental health needs of children? Next, we have Dr. Ricca. He's superintendent of the White Plains School District in New York. Dr. Ricca. Hi, everybody. Uh, and Chris, thank you so much uh, for, having, for having this panel. And it's, it's already been wonderful to hear uh, from the contributors thus far. I'm Joe Ricca and a very proud superintendent of schools here in the White Plains City School District in uh, White Plains, Westchester County, New York. And uh, like so many school districts across the country and, and so many of uh, what we've already heard, we're really thinking a lot about coming back in September and making sure that we have the appropriate um, supports in place for not just, not only our children, right, but also our adults and our community members. So um, moving to the, to the next slide, uh, basically a three-prong approach here in White Plains. And I, I wanna go back to something Jesse had mentioned right at the outset, that before we can ever decide um, that yes, we need to go 110% uh, academics to make sure that we fill in, backfill any gaps uh, so that there's no quote unquote learning loss, the first thing we need to attend to is the very human needs uh, associated with all of our learners. Um, so, right, we, we kind of say Maslow uh, uh, before, <laughs> right, before Bloom and make sure that we're addressing any existing trauma and ongoing trauma uh, that is not just coming out of the pandemic, but also all of the many stresses associated um, with life in general, and then of course, living life during the pandemic. So a mechanism for identification of trauma in our schools was important. And we're devoting a, a great many resources to making sure that um, all of our helping professionals uh, have the tools that they need uh, to be able to identify issues from both profound and, and really debilitating issues of trauma to, you know, just sort of social anxiety or having, having some concern with re-entry into society. Now, we were very fortunate here in White Plains. Um, we had all of our children back full time uh, in, in March uh, and, and April. So we were able to sort of use that time period um, as a ramping up for the next academic year and making sure um, that we were attending to the needs of, of our kids as they came back into school uh, after being in, in both a remote and a hybrid setting. But we also know that there are a number of learners who weren't able to come back um, for a variety of reasons, and they're gonna be setting foot in schools for the very first time come September. So we're really trying to make sure that we have the mechanisms in place to identify that need, the professional development, ongoing support and commitment to professional development for our faculty and staff members, and, our, and, and also for our community members uh, to make sure that, that they have all of the skills necessary to support our kids. We also have partnered with community partners to bring clinics into our facilities so that children have real-time access to health care uh, clinicians when needed, again, in conjunction and support from social workers and guidance counselors with, of course, parent and guardian approval. Um, but, but you know, having these resources in our facilities goes a long way to making sure that we're able to support our kids. We also did something a little bit different with our American Rescue uh, Plan funds. And, and we uh, took a, a, a portion of those funds and really reinvested them into our workforce. Um, folks who were with us all throughout the pandemic and who are uh, coming back in September, we have a, a wellness initiative. It's just $50 a month, but it's a total of $500. And you know when you think about what folks did above and beyond um, all of the, the necessary aspects and the critical aspects of education, um, we think it goes a long way to showing people how 
uh, committed they how committed they were to our kids and how committed we are to thanking them appropriately. So, uh, you know, with all of the different ways that you can approach um, supporting children and supporting parents and guardians and community members, we've tried to do it in a way that's really multifaceted that does keep trauma at the at the forefront in terms of addressing those issues prior to thinking that we're going to be able to successfully navigate and backfill learning loss. So final thoughts, I think, um, you know, for 21, 22, and if you just click that again for me, Chris, um, I think it will all pop up there. Yeah, um, gratitude, making sure that we're keeping, uh, you know, ev every day and everything that we do, um, a gratefulness for the opportunity to serve our community and serve our kids, keeping that commitment front and center uh, and making sure the parents and guardians understand that no matter where they're coming from after the pandemic or even as we're still navigating the pandemic, we're going to be here to support them. You can click again. Resilience, recognizing that that is not a constant for everyone. There is a continuum of care and a continuum of concern. I may just be able to bounce back from a lot of things while Thomas might take a little bit longer. We have to respect that, understand that and support those individuals all throughout the, the, their journey. I don't need to explain grace and how important it is uh, for all of us as public servants serving children and their families to do that or to, to display that in every way that we can. Again, right? Um, folks need to be loved. We say there are two things you probably don't say enough in your life. I love you and thank you. Um, we try to make sure that our children and all of our community members here in the White Plains City School District feel that love um, and care in everything that they do. And then finally, Staying WP proud. And this is our, our, our silly hashtag, but it really is at the center of everything. We want to be proud about our commitment to each other, supporting each other, and making sure that nobody gets left behind as we move through this very difficult time. And thank you so much. So, Dr. Ricca, thank you. Thank you for reminding us of the importance of self care and what we can do to support our staff. Thank you for reminding us about community partners. We've heard about community partners for a couple of, from a couple of our guests so far. And then finally, these thoughts, <clears throat> these thoughts about resilience and love. Those are so important. Khalil, could you talk for a minute about equity and mindfulness and what you've been doing in the Washington DC area? Sure, thank you so much, Dr. Mason. Really, really happy to be here today. Um, I am uh, Khalil Kirkendall. I'm working with the Montgomery County Public School uh, System here in Rockville, Maryland. I'm also um, really blessed to work with DCPS school system, as well as um, I teach courses at George Washington University. Uh, one of the things that we have been focusing on is we're preparing to re-enter uh, the schools and reintegrate our society is how to develop a systematic approach to really foster wellness and resilience within um, our school buildings and within our school body community. Some of the things that we have been um, really, really working with this summer is how do we um, combine uh, mindfulness with trauma-informed and restorative justice, uh, realizing that trauma and stress are, are, are just chronic public health issues that we're all um, dealing with, but also realizing that um, we need ways and teachers, instructors, educators need tools um, to sort of deal with trauma and the effect of, of stress um, it's having on our students um, so that you know ultimately we don't end up harming ourselves or the most prized and the most important um, our children and our students. Um, so one of the things that we are looking at as we look at um, trauma and um, even you know having conversations, um, having those mindful conversations, and looking at um, racism as a form of trauma, and how do we deal with that within our communities and our our, our our societies? And I know when I was working with a group of teachers last week, you know the paradox of mindfulness is that it's so simple that it's complicated, and really um, a lot of these things start with us as individuals, even before we get to um, our students, but learning uh, the benefits of, of breathing 
and, and those moments of calm and realizing that those are the foundation for our emotional intelligence. And it's these skills of, of resilience and compassion that um, helps to bring mindfulness more into uh, the school and, uh, and trauma that the students may be dealing with. So some of the things that we've been doing, particularly in Montgomery County, uh, one of the things we started doing in April, we now have a, uh, a student um, TV production, it's called Students Speaking Up, and the students from across the um, county are now making various videos and speaking about all sorts of issues, everything from anxiety to emotional wellness, emotional intelligence to trauma, racism. And we've really found that that giving students a voice to sort of talk about how they feel where they are right now in the midst of a pandemic um, has been really, really helpful. We've gotten a lot of traction with working with the school board, um, having the students to um, play videos and uh, deliver um, deliver uh, testimony at the uh, local school board. Um, meetings. We are also, um, we've also created um, over, I don't know, maybe a, over 200 videos um, that students and parents and teachers can go to to practice mindfulness. Um, we're also looking at how that plays out with different, um, the importance of having um, culturally responsive tools as we relate to mindfulness so that everyone uh, feels included. So we're looking at a couple of different things like enhanced meta awareness, um, learning ways to decrease stereotype threats around mindfulness and equity, um, looking at authentic ways um, that our students, our parents, and our teachers can cultivate kindness and compassion in the classroom. Um, we're also becoming more aware of how um, to emotionally regulate ourselves with using things like mindfulness and trauma-informed practices along with um, social and emotional learning. Uh, lastly, uh, we're looking at ways to heal um, embodied life trauma, um, really recognizing and sitting in that um, and recognizing that that's a real issue um, if we are going to be aware and present. And um, finally, just the development of non-judgmental um, awareness. Uh, these are exercises that we, and tools that we're gonna be using across the county and various schools. Um, we're in the process now of, of doing more training with our teachers um, and still working with our students to hear um, their voice and, um, and their issues. Khalil, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you, mentioned mindfulness, just that awareness, that consciousness is so important. You know, it's hard to have a compassionate response for yourself or others if you don't first have that awareness. Just like it's hard to, to really care for others if you don't do that self-care first. Those are important. And then equity, when we think about equity, um, it reminds us not only did some students struggle more than others during COVID because of inequities, but there are students who face long-term trauma and injustice and intergenerational trauma because of racism and discrimination. And those things are still with us and still need to be addressed. And as students come back this fall, these will be other things we will need to handle. So right now we're gonna go ahead and open the floor up to questions and, uh, and comments. And please go ahead and use the raise your hand feature. And Jeff, I see you've got a question, go ahead. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, hi, everybody. Jeff Eichler. Um, I've been so fortunate to serve with Chris and Jesse um, um, as, a, as a talking partner. I don't have uh, uh, trauma in my background, but uh, it's really been a pleasure to work with them um, in, in the planning of this. Um, I currently uh, serve as a, a podcast host, and I've been interviewing a lot of superintendents, uh, assistant superintendents, principals, and so on. And what I hear over and over again related to this, um, yes, kids have certainly experienced trauma, but so have faculty members. And I'm just curious from the, the panel members, uh, perhaps US and Canada, what specifically can we do, are doing that 
help identify um, uh, trauma on the part of the, the faculty, because one of the things I hear is that teachers are leaving, administrators are leaving, and how do, how do we stem that? So who would like to, to answer? Hello, uh, my name is Richard Matthews, and I'm um, uh, I'm pleased to speak to that um, question because I think it's a, such an important one. Um, I'm coming to you from beautiful Vancouver Island and the traditional unceded territories of the Penelicate and um, Shumanus First Nations. I'm so happy to be with you all here, and and um, amazing to hear these discussions. In specific answer to that, what I just heard is, uh, you know, I really strongly believe we need to find a way uh, for our frontline workers, our classroom teachers, our support people in the classrooms to be able to tell their story, to be able to, to um, tell people and especially senior admin or administrators what's going on for them. Because if they feel heard, um, I, I, you know, we've, we've only started to do this and in our presentation, we'll talk a little bit about that. But when, when people feel heard about what's going and especially when they feel heard in the hierarchy of our school systems and I know we're trying to get more equitable and all that kind of stuff but whatever we do we have an uh, we have a hierarchy when people feel heard from higher level up it's a great relief for them and and I I think more than wellness plans which are important more than directing people to their support is is having those avenues where they can feel heard uh, in whatever creative way is possible is going to go a long way to um, helping helping people. Um, and, I, and I say that as a frontline worker myself and my wife is a classroom teacher and just as a school counselor working with so many this year, especially uh, working with adults more than kids, to be perfectly honest. Um, thank you. Thank you. So before we go on, Richard, first, I want to say thank you. Great concepts and ideas. And we're going to go back for just a minute. We have Dr. Shante Garrett, who's now joined us, uh, and she's going to talk a little about her work in uh, Rocky Mount. So, Dr. Garrett. Hey, good afternoon. How are you all? We're doing well. Thank you. Good. Thank you. It's great to be able to join you. Um, and I was asked to focus towards the trauma and equity lens of this work. And um, I can tell you that we um, were grateful to receive the ESSER funding, um, not only to close learning gaps, um, but to also be able to pursue um, the outcomes that we were already pursuing pre-COVID and use that funding to do that. And so when we are talking about using our um, funding towards um, in a post pandemic or as we are um, looking at education as it stands now, we still remain very focused on equity. That is one of our core values within our um, school community. We value equity and we understand equity not just as being a means of, of supplying students with what they need. And we say that in the context to meet or exceed standards um, so that we actually have something to compare it to, but also in the context of realizing that equity can't happen if barriers are still in the way. So we use this um, ESSER funding as well to be breaking down barriers. So what would some of those barriers be? Just like many other districts, we did the Chromebooks and we did the hotspots and we'll continue to do those. So we made sure we had money to continue, you know, to make, to be able to provide that knowing that sometimes they get damaged, they get repaired. Um, we may still, we still have internet access issues and remote learning may not be going away completely, right? Um, but moving past that, you know, one of the things that we learned last year or we realized is that if we were going to try to give our scholars as full an experience as possible virtually, then there were still tools and things that they were going to need beyond the internet and beyond Chromebooks. They needed to be able to engage authentically. They 
needed to put it in a way that were meaningful to them even pre-COVID. And so we sent home the various school supplies that our scholars would need. And that is part of, that's a significant chunk of what we are doing with our ESSER money as well. Our families are not buying school supplies this year. We are supplying everything that they would need, even right down to the book bags, because that's just is not going to be an issue if that, if that is a barrier for any scholar. Um, we've also used our money to um, be able to create um, additional opportunities. And we were always built on opportunities, but we know that one of the things that COVID challenged for a lot of communities was hope. And hope is essential, especially when you're building back post COVID. So what are some ways that we are building efficacy and building hope and attaching this to the social and emotional aspects of student learning? One, um, we haven't made the investment in a social and emotional learning curriculum. When we talk about building hope and instilling hope, we needed our scholars to know that there's still opportunity after this, that what has happened during COVID is not going to define them. And so we know that we, um, we wanted our scholars to, uh, we were already pursuing college access opportunities and we increased those. We're using our money to sponsor and increase dual enrollment program. Um, so beyond our partnership with the junior college, we are also partnering with the local college and developed the MOU. So our, college, our scholars could get additional college credits um, from a four-year institution, but they're also gonna be able to earn military service credits. And so COVID is not gonna define what happened for this year. They're gonna be able to look into their future and see those opportunities even post COVID. The final thing I would say is to be able to invest with intention and our intention is in alignment with our mission and our vision. Um, and you can see some of the other investments that we made in the slides that I prepared, um, but just being very, very intentional about how we are, are using the, the funding, including reducing the class sizes and finding and cre creative ways to um, in, increase instructional time during the day and during the week. So Dr. Garrett, thank you so much. I think you've given us a, a lot to think about in terms of what we can do to continue to support the academic and the social emotional needs of students. You know, we've been hearing some that there's an, a learning gap or an academic gap for some students. And some of us are a little skeptical about what that might mean. Is there somebody who'd like to just talk for a moment about you know, is there really a gap? And, and is how high a priority does that become versus dealing with the trauma and the alienation, the stress that students have been under? I've seen, um, I, I've, I keep hearing about the learning gap and, and do I believe that on standardized scores, we might see that. I do, but I really perceive the gap as a perceptual issue of the adults working with kids, that it's not necessarily that the, the students are that far behind, but that that our perception of what they should be doing needs to shift. We need to support kids. We need to have them come in and talk to our staff about learning about routines, going back into relationships and routines, relationships and routines, and then we need to start working on the academics. But if all we focus on is uh, you know trying to shove more um, services to get to increase the academics, I think that's going to increase more stress and then we're going to have more issues. So really kind of building upon that and then taking a look at what, what is the true story of the scores? What is it really telling us? And as adults, are we being flexible enough in thinking about that? Thank you, Rachel. And Dr. Ricca, you have a comment? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I think it's so typical of us to uh, view children and view their schooling through a deficit model. That's really what we've done all throughout our country. Uh, we've always talked about how children aren't living up to a particular measure or standard. And a lot of that is just bunk. Um, we were talking about so-called learning loss before there was ever a, a shred of data to support 
uh, that meme that that came to life out there. And let us not kid ourselves, right? This is about money and it's about driving uh, costs associated with so-called panaceas um, that are going to swoop into your school district and they're going to address all of the ills, uh, both academic and emotional that children experience throughout the pandemic. I would suggest to you uh, that we need to address and assess uh, each individual child independent and unique and determine what, what they need when they come back to our schools. To paint a broad brush that somehow this is going to be a lost generation. I wanna remind everybody, the last time that we had a major pandemic was right during the time of what many folks consider to be America's greatest generation. Um, folks who came through a very challenging period, of course there were additional challenges associated during that time, as there are now, um, that helped to fortify and really drive a generation of, in, in this case, and, and sorry to, to my Canadian friends, um, a, a generation of Americans uh, who were able to innovate and overcome a great many challenges. So I would much rather take a look at um, our children individually, independently, and, with a, and, and thank you for bringing up the fact that in most cases, they're talking about high stake standardized assessments, which we know are terrible indicators. Um, for overall academic achievement and success, and certainly um, for how somebody is going to be situated in society. Um, let's take a step back. Let's not use a deficit model. Let's congratulate our children, support our families, bring our children back into our schools and get them what they need so that they can keep moving forward. Thank you so much. And Eva, I think you might have a comment as well, a question. Yes, I do. I have a comment. Uh, thank you so much, Christine. Um, I totally agree with the two previous speakers. Um, I, uh, I think that we need to remember as well that in this year, the children have developed, their brains have grown and developed. Uh, brains don't grow through teaching. They grow through taking the information that we've that taught and then growing the connections. And for some of our students, not all of them, but for many of our students, the, it was actually quite restful to be at home. They could sleep a bit longer. They were not engaged all day. They didn't have all the rough and tumble of, of the peer associations that sometimes can be a challenge. So they're coming back to us with a brain that has grown and developed, which will then make it easier for us to actually teach the skills and move the skills uh, to a, along to them. So we all know that education is all circular uh, spiral, spiral learning as well. So I think uh, some teachers will be pleasantly surprised that the children will catch on much faster because their brains are more ready for that learning. Thank you so much. I want to toss another question out and then feel free to either answer the previous one or, or this question. This has to do with flexibility and what you might have submitted your allocations for ESSER funds or maybe the upcoming Title I funds. And you know, are your, um, your budget, your proposed budget, is it written in stone? Do you have everything planned out in detail for the next year? Or if you, your district, learn something in the next month, six weeks, eight weeks, can you in fact go back and make some adjustments? And because I know there's a lot of prescription in like the ESSER funds, there are like 18 categories and not much of it looks at social emotional learning. So I'm just curious to see, you know, where are you in terms of flexibility? Hi, this is Donna from San Carlos. We are actually doing um, what we call change agents. We are training staff on SEL, mindfulness, trauma, and there's like three or four from each school. And then they go back and do the train to trainer model. And so we're using some of our, our funds for that, that they make binders for their, um, each school will get what is um, negotiable and what is not negotiable. So that's something that we're doing is, is training our staff on, um, SEL and trauma and even classroom environment. Thank you. I have a related question that has to do with sustainability and looking at this windfall we, we are receiving with stimulus funds. We don't know when we'll see this much money, you know, put into education again. And I wonder how much thought you've given to the long term impact of the funding you're receiving. Being um, Canadian and, and um, it's driven, funding is driven by the provinces and so is education. So it's not, uh, it's more to do with um, the overall conversation that we've been having earlier, not particularly about those specific funds and related to 
the um, uh, current crisis of the pandemic. I would like to uh, speak to what I've heard as a theme, stepping away from uh, the trauma focused, but also to the equity focus that I've heard and that long-term sustainability driven through a strategic plan and driven through um, a strategic plan that doesn't relate to money, but uh, relates to um, uh, both vision, mission, and um, truth and reconciliation. And as I heard um, some of the uh, people speaking earlier, is that yes, um, I know we have to be careful about data. I totally agree about uh, uh, individual uh, students and taking kids from where they are to where they need to be. I totally get that. But there is some um, endemic uh, societal institutionalized um, elements that, are, that uh, involve inequity. And we have to face up to that fact. And I think that there is data to indicate, uh, particularly in our context, in regard to indigenous students, there is a huge inequity in regard to outcomes. And we call it the, the, the racism of low expectation. And the conversation is with the adults, not with the kids. And definitely in regard to how uh, the adults perceive the kids and their ability um, to move forward and what that limit looks like. And that also happens um, uh, when we're talking about kids that have experienced trauma. Uh, instead of focusing on the resiliency component, they focus on trauma as a reason for not learning. We'll get to the specifics around some of the interventions that have been, um, uh, we do have some funding that's become available um, to support mental health. We see that social emotional learning and mental health as a huge element, but it predates the pandemic and certainly maybe have uh, been exacerbated by it. But those inequities have also been increased in regard to the pandemic and how we uh, have been using our resources. And we have to always be aware of that uh, longer term uh, inst institutionalized difference between how uh, we support students that year over year through culture or race um, have not had the same opportunity or had been uh, viewed in a manner that continues to create that difference in regard to student outcomes that uh, is still maintained over time. Thank you, Thomas. You know, as you're speaking, it reminds me that uh, there's some things that we can do that are short term that will have an impact. And there are the things that we can do that will make a huge difference if we have more coherence. So if there is a way to bring things together so that year after year students get the same sorts of support so that they get compassion in their classrooms, because mental health providers it's wonderful. We definitely need more mental health supports in schools, but there's so much that the individual teacher or staff member can do in that day-to-day, moment-to-moment interactions with children. And there's so much that children can do to support each other. And with that, I think let's just turn now to uh, Hannah and Tamara. And can you talk a little about what you're doing in Canada? Absolutely. Thank you, Christine. Um, so Tamara and I have been working hard um, to really, I mean, we, we, wrote, we wrote a book which came after the pandemic, um, a crazy time to release a book, but really supporting educators in how we can support children's emotional health and community building. Um, we've been looking at um, trying to get to root causes and supporting um, educators and understanding that we are emotional beings. And I think unless I mean, we don't, one of the things I think is really important, and I've heard this thread throughout, is that, is that we don't need to be a psychologist to work with emotion. Our, the teachers can, can do this. We don't, it's sort of like you don't need to be, you know, a nutritionist to understand that kids need to eat. This is, once we understand that emotion drives behavior, we have such an opportunity to see things differently. So we've been trying to, we've been working with school boards across Canada and England and the UK and other places where we're trying, where we're looking at emotions get stirred up. This is what we, we are emotional beings. And so during challenging times uh, like COVID, for example, many emotions will be stirred up in our students, particularly alarm and frustration would be the two key emotions that are gonna be stirred up in challenging times. And what this means is that we will be seeing increased eruptions 
as well as increased um, anxiety. So we'll be seeing aggression and, and, and alarm-based behaviors increase. And what we know about emotion is that it seeks expression. That's why the word, word motion's in there. It moves throughout us and emotion seeks expression. And then this requires um, emotional safety. So yeah, um, Tamara was gonna speak to, to, to that. And yeah, this, this piece of emotional safety is so important. And I, and I think, you know, physical safety, of course, we know physical safety is important. That's, that's not something that I think we, um, you know, we need to, to uh, speak too much about, but the emotional safety is often missed. And this piece where there is room for um, things to be processed, that, that there's room for things to, to move in us. And that recognizing that this piece, if we are, if we are stuck in an alarm state, if we are stuck with our alarm on all the time, we're not receptive to learning. We're not able to take anything in, as some of you have already talked about. This piece of, of, of being receptive is huge when it comes to learning, to growth, um, and to emotional health. And so what, what are the conditions? What are the conditions that can create that kind of receptivity? And having this emotional safety for, for emotions to move, um, not just to go away or to, to hide them somewhere, but to actually move through them, this is the challenge. Um, and many of our students are coming into our classrooms without that place of emotional safety. And emotional safety, as we're looking at, comes from uh, basically two different two different places where it can be can can feel safe for a child, and that is through some of these um, experiences, expression through free play, uh, through nature, through process based based arts, um, not performance based here. We're not talking about where we're focused on outcome, but because that can cause more alarm, that 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 changes the nature of it. But it's through these experiences that 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 our children can digest their world, they can process their world. And then the other avenue is through relationship. Yeah. It's through the people. It's through, it's through those, the relationships where there's an adult in their life that can, um, uh, that feels safe to them to be able to see them, feel invited by their presence to, to. Um, it's, it's our caring leadership. So yeah. that we look at you know very much what does caring leadership mean so that children can emotionally rest on the adults and that we need to be intentional in building and preserving relationships with our students and relationships such a buzzword in education but what what does it actually mean so we're supporting our you know learning communities and understanding this but that this can be easy with children who for, let's say who are easy but with our challenging students this is they need it the most they need us to to which which the last slide which was collecting and bridging they need us um, um these are you know dr new dr gordon newfeld attachment rituals which he describes here which collecting is to engaging the attachment instincts it's the greetings it's the intentional intentionality of the caring adult in the child's life and bridging is is I mean, there's many aspects to bridging, but briefly here, what I'm gonna to speak to is bridging things that could divide. And, and in, in our research um, in the past couple of years, we've been exploring principles, for example, um, who there's nothing can get in the way of the relationship. So for, for example, if a student has been um, disciplined in some way or suspended or something, we are even now seeing principles going into the suspended child's home and bringing goodies and tea in Canada to welcome them back and say, our school's not the same without you. Yes, you did something that was, was not okay. Yes, this was not okay. But we're making room for something new to emerge. We're welcoming you back, it's not the same. And so looking at adults intentionally creating the bridge for the student to come back as opposed to leaving any student hanging, the students that need it the most. This is our work, our work as adults. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then moving to the next slide is, um, and what, what we believe is that even often when we're doing this as caring leaders in our classrooms, sometimes our learners can still get stuck in seeing themselves as I'm the stupid one, or I'm bad, or I'm mean, or I'm lazy, or I'm whatever. And we, we need to help shift their identity. And I don't think we can teach people 
to feel. You can't teach this, it's the fruit of different experiences. So one of the things we can do in our classrooms is place our children and youth into experiences which allow them to discover their caring feelings, discover their leadership, um, et cetera. And so that could be having them take care of class pets. It could be having them, um, whatever, whatever you know, these things are. It's, it's, you can't teach someone to care about someone. You can't teach someone to love. You can show them what it looks like. You can say, this is how you pet the cat. This is how you brush it. This, But you can't teach someone to feel. You can only create the conditions in which feelings grow. So we'll shift gears here to, to hearing from our, our, um, our district, starting with uh, my local district here, Cowichan Valley School District, and Thomas Longridge and Richard Matthews, um, who are here to represent and say a few things about what they are doing. Um, I squeal, CM, that's it. I want to see Lamnala. Um, it's uh, good to see all of uh, my respected friends. Um, that was um, the language of the Kauts and Mestimach, Coast Salish people, the uh, Halkaminim speaking people, where we work, um, live and learn. Um, I'd like to recognize that for thousands of years, uh, they have cared for this territory where I am now a settler. Um, so thank you all uh, for this opportunity today. Um, it's been fa fabulous to hear the, the uh, uh, different initiatives that are happening across the continent and are so aligned. Um, and I know it's just not the impetus of the opportunity for funding, it's leveraging whatever funding that we can use to um, um, make those initiatives work and live and uh, sustain themselves over time. Um, it is a long-term approach. Um, it is involving uh, a culture of care and that's what we're responsible for in our strategic plan. And it is based on compassionate systems leadership. And that's uh, what um, uh, we're engaged in in the work that we've been doing in our school district. Uh, helping school teams incorporate the voices um, of our stakeholders, which are the students, staff and families uh, to develop action plans uh, that support uh, meaningful change. Um, we do have, uh, as part of our uh, curriculum within British Columbia, an expectation of social emotional learning as being a dimension um, of our learning uh, equal to um, and, co and connected to our academic learning and um, uh, student outcomes. To that end, we have um, uh, got initiatives in high school such as Go To Mental Health, uh, which is Stan Kucher's work um, in regard to building capacity and understanding both in the adults um, within our buildings and our, our uh, students in regard to understanding mental health and mental well being. Um, we, at the elementary level, uh, um, grade three through seven, have a, um, a everyday anxiety strategy for educators, which is again a if you look at the uh, response intervention model, which is really a level one um, intervention for all students and the staff in order to be able to work with the students. You don't have to be a clinician, as was said, um, to understand and give kids tools in which to uh, regulate and control their um, uh, emotions and understand them. Uh, and then connected to even uh, our K uh, one and grade one and two, uh, the comp curriculum, which is again, is about uh, understanding emotions and self-regulation. Um, and we have Reclaiming Our Students um, uh, Professional Development Series, which will be uh, uh, work did in a small way this year and we'll be kicking in the work with um, uh, Hannah and Tamara as we um, uh, reach out to all our stakeholders, including our parents. I, I do look at, um, it, not just about money. Uh, what we learned is what stood out was uh, the need to staff adults um, as agents of support and change, uh, as social emotional leaders in our areas of influence. Um, and I think that that's the focus. It's about um, uh, changing the conversation as well as having the conversation and allowing those voices to be heard. 
Um, Richard, please, um, Richard Matthews um, is um, on the ground and involved in many of those initiatives in the train the trainer model. And he's a key um, um, a proponent of social emotional learning as well as a skilled um, uh, practitioner in regard to building capacity within our school district um, and our uh, individual school teams. Um, and Richard, maybe you want to uh, talk about some of the uh, uh, other elements that we're uh, bringing into the conversation, because I know our time is limited. Yeah, thank you, Tom. And I just really want to briefly talk about one specific uh, initiative that's, um, you know, sort of representative of some, of some other things that we're trying to do that incorporates a lot of what we've heard already and what we've talked about. Um, you know, we have seen over the last number of years uh, very much increased incidents of um, highly reactive events that happen in schools and especially in our elementary schools. And we're talking about um, children who are in that alarm state and have that very strong um, fight or flight response um, and end up, um, you know, as traumatized individuals themselves, they end up, you know, having these explosive events that that have caused all kinds of trouble and concern and, and uh, in classroom environments. And in practice, what ends up happening with those children is they end up being excluded from our school environments because they, you know, where they get suspended, or they get removed from the school environment. What we wanna do is change that conversation and try to understand that these traumatic events um, that happen in our, in our classroom, really what it comes down to is um, that it's a it's a breach of relationship and that what we need to do is repair those relationships for all the stakeholders the parents the teachers and the students themselves and so we're trying to take a district uh, approach to that when a school has exhausted their own resources uh, about how to support um, students that we want to have a district approach to it and here's some of the principles that we're we're following um, um, you know, the understanding that highly reactive behavior is rooted in trauma and trauma begets trauma. So we need to ha have that really uh, basic understanding with our all of our staff and our parents. And um, um, uh, the model that we're following is uh, called UCARO. It's a non-crisis, uh, a non-violent crisis intervention model, um, comfort versus control. It's a very important conceptual change. Um, understanding that behavior is a form of communication, the district structure that I'm talking about, which is um, a referral process where school teams can get the help that they need um, uh, from the district level. It could be multidisciplinary. It could be involving community agencies. Um, and then there's that dedicated mentoring and focus staff and training opportunities for those school teams that are going through this uh, situations, really trying to keep our kids in school and get away from that exclusion model where we've ended up, uh, we, we've, we've become inclusionary in so many ways with, uh, with uh, over the years, you know, all of us have seen that in our lifetimes, how we, the schools become much more able to include people with differing needs, but behavior is the one uh, aspect of, of uh, developmental need that still keeps kids um, out of school and on part-time programs. And we're really, really trying to work towards um, having those supported return to school plans rather than the suspensions and, um, and exclusion, exclusionary practice. So that's a really quick uh, thing into, into one aspect of how we're trying to uh, be compassionate uh, in these situations with these highly reactive students. Thank you for your uh, time. Thank you. Thank you both Thomas and Richard and for representing and um, we'll, we'll move to David McFall, who's the principal in the Ottawa area, actually got no Quebec, but uh, it's borders Ottawa there. And just to speak to some of his innovations and um, yeah, David. Well, hello, Tamara. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. As, as Tamara said, I'm from Ottawa, Canada, which is uh, the capital. But my school, a large elementary school, is on the western tip of Quebec. And from our school, we can see the Parliament buildings in, in Ottawa. So it's, uh, it's a very interesting location. I'm currently on vacation with, with family down in Prince Edward County, which is a little peninsula in um, Lake Ontario. We're probably directly across from Rochester, New York. So I just would like, I'm very honored to be part of this roundtable discussion with colleagues from, from Canada and, and the United States. 
I've had the fortune to work with uh, Tamara and Eva and Hannah for maybe 10 years in, in total. And uh, the focus of today's conversation is really about trying to quote and understand why schools and how schools have to change. Obviously, the pandemic has brought to light some of the, um, the needs, the emotional needs that schools are now, have always been, but are more than ever now forced to support these growing emotional needs in schools. The last six years, we've transformed our, our, our program in, in school because even as early as kindergarten, we could see these children coming into schools. They may be five years of age physiologically, but there are many students. I think we've been collecting the data over the last five years. We'd say 20 to 25% of our students are emotionally probably two years delayed from the expectations, the milestones that one would expect of a five-year-old. And this has forced us to rethink traditional education. And I think the, the greatest push is, that will come from any trauma-based programs post-pandemic or any programs that have been a real necessity in our schools that we want to close. One of the questions earlier was about a, a cl closing the achievement gap or closing the learning gap. But if we don't bridge this emotional gap, if these five-year-olds who are emotionally three don't have a chance to to catch up in their emotional maturation at an early time in elementary school, this gap, the emotional gap in their, their actual age or physiological age will persist through elementary school, through high school. And I've seen it for the past 10 years. So in terms of investment, in terms of rethinking, reimagining our schools, we have to look, and uh, the slides that I have today are, are really looking beyond the classroom. And I. Uh, when, you, when you're when you focused on a certain area and you hear a word over and over again and you hear the word classroom and um, it just goes to speak how traditional we have become in education, that we see school as the schoolhouse, we see the classroom as the four walls and and therefore the um, perpetuation of, of traditional views of how, how teaching and learning is supposed to unfold from our teachers who take a lot of their teaching practices from their experiences in the classroom them, themselves. So by what we've done over five years, and this is starting to move through our school board, is taking a more outdoor approach to teaching and learning. And I have to, to caution everyone that any changes, and I hear of our US colleagues with, uh, with their funding and, and planning how they're going to spend, but any initiatives, any, any affiliation to a strategic plan or direction orientation. It, it's not that money can be squandered, but money can be invested as wisely if there isn't the culture to support these initiatives, these, these changes. And so the evidence to, to provide teachers, systems, parents with, um, with a, a reason for, for investment in particular areas, a reason for change. And if you think of the outdoors and how you can weave teaching and learning through play and nature, and you can align it to the curriculum. I, I'll tell you just one, one sentence that I think would, would probably sum up why, why we should start to rethink our schools and move outdoors and work with our municipalities and provincial governments, even federal governments for funding to, to find safe green spaces, especially in urban areas. And when we have our green spaces that are on school property, off school property, we can move the learning differently. The one, the one line I think is, is so important. In a year, in a year, or maybe in the last three years as we've been moving towards this, not one single student has been to my office when they've been outdoors learning or outdoors to play. And we talk about Tamara and we talk, uh, listen to Hannah of how we've been, um, and, uh, and Thomas, I think, was saying it, that the, the students, the explosive, impulsive students that are reacting because they're not emotionally equipped to sit in a classroom, to sit for six to seven hours. They need to move. But teachers don't realize that, even though it's been said for many years. But not one child in the last two years has been sent to my office from outdoors. So I, I just feel that this is a massive paradigm shift. There will have to be investment in teacher training. There will be have, have to be a, a major um, shift in thinking of how education 
needs to move forward. If we persist with keeping education within the four walls of the classroom, the, the, the emotional, the physical, physiological gap will grow and more impulsive, more frustrated children will be in our schools and they will not to, they'll never be able to reach the potential. And so there's, the groundwork has to be made. There has to be professional development. Our school board, thankful, has, uh, has, has signed up this year for the um, Reclaiming Our Students PD series because the staff, without training, there will be resistance for any changes in education. There will always be resistance. So it's how do you gradually show people to the, to the water in a sense of how moving education from the classroom to outside will benefit children and will ultimately benefit the adults, the teachers, the staff within the school. But I think the biggest paradigm shift is, is for the realization that if we can think of our schools as attachment based child centered schools, not adult centered institutions, that in itself will be a major shift in thinking. But it is a process and it will take time and the culture has to be there to support the change. And the changes will have to move slowly. So in terms of investing money, sustainability, and moving forward, it's really to look at the emotional health of our children. So just to, to let you know, I'm a school psychologist by uh, training, and I've been in this, involved in schools for uh, many, many years. But for the last 20 years, I've been working with the English School Boards of Quebec. I'm the provincial consultant in the area of behavior disorders. And so I relate very much to what Richard was saying about those students who disrupt the learning. Um, and they, they really, um, my challenge has been, and, and luckily I've worked with, uh, with the 10 English School Boards of Quebec, David being one of the, my, my key uh, partners, uh, always willing to try something new, to find a different way, uh, and using a very developmental trauma-informed approach. And one of the things that we've come up with, uh, and this is not, uh, I've, I've spearheaded this, but I have people that have actually implemented this in both elementary and high schools. So and in a way of helping those kids, children who cannot stay in the regular classroom without actually creating a special classroom because those are very expensive. So we call them nurturing support centers. Uh, there's a website uh, link there that you can access where you can get a lot of details about how this works, but it's a room and a space within a school that is part of an intervention continuum, part of the intervention continuum managed by the adults, which provides a quiet, structured, secure environment that's nurturing and supportive. And that provides a respite, not only for the children who are in distress, but also for the teachers. Because some of these children can be very hard on teachers. Um, we, we, it's supervised and managed by our nurturing support center team. And I'll talk about that in a moment. With the students who have been identified, uh, there are some regular times in which they're, they're allowed to be at the nurturing support center. Uh, first thing in the morning, at various times throughout the day, we do check-ins and check-outs. For some children, especially at the high school level, a shorter time in class, an alternative to certain classes. Um, all, these are all the times when they experience the most difficulty. Um, they also, we provide sheltered recess and breaks, sheltered transitions and sheltered lunch. Of course, not all of these children are predictable, so we have unscheduled times. We have times when um, they are uh, with, um, just excuse me for a moment here, with a substitute teacher, when we know the home situation is difficult, when the student is not in good shape, so we've done a check-in and, and they're not in good shape, or when this teacher determines that there's a need for a break, or if the student also can identify that they need a break. Um, so again, obviously this is ma managed by the, um, by the adults. Now, what's really important is that there is a team um, so we have uh, teachers, administrators, the staff, because we have two people that are always in the center. They're there full time to be able to welcome the children. Obviously, our professionals, uh, resource teachers, all to support people that are at the school level or from the district level as well, um, who meet regularly to identify the students, to make an action plan for them, to reassess the action plan, to look at what's needed, um, and to basically make sure that everything is working. And uh, again, I really appreciated uh, Thomas and Richard what you were saying about this is also a time when people can support each other as adults. What's working, what's not working, how can we do it differently for you, the adults as well. Key into all of this is professional development. What we see affects what we do. 
And so the um, what I have been working with for the last 20 years with the schools uh, that are willing to work with me and the school districts that are willing to work with me is really coming to understand children from a developmental perspective. And we use Dr. Neufeld's uh, comprehensive uh, developmental paradigm that is based in neuroscience, that's based in trauma research, um, but also just really getting into the neuroscience of brain development. Uh, PBS, I love PBS because they, they highlighted for us how that teen brain is so far away from full development that we need to understand that. Um, using and understanding the role of emotion. And you heard Hannah and uh, Tamara speak to that. And so we are using their PD program. Um, and finally, um, using trauma res responsive interventions um, based, and there's so many people that are doing this right now, but I'm inspired by the Australian Childhood Foundation by, um, by Bruce Perry and the tra Childhood Trauma, the ACEs study. So these are all things that, that staff need to be developed, uh, trained in. And so thank you so much. Thank you to our Canadian colleagues for uh, sharing with you everything you've done. It's, it's so wonderful to see this cross-cultural um, passion, compassion, and so many people speaking from your heart and thinking about the hearts and minds of the children we serve. Jeff, why don't you speak for a moment about the upcoming podcasts, and then we'll go to Melissa to talk about neuroscience after that. Okay, so um, uh, this is actually the last slide in the deck and, and you'll see this uh, when it's sent to you. Uh, one of the things that uh, Chris and Jesse and, and Hannah and Tamara and I talked about is that uh, beyond this meeting today, we want to, we want to have, uh, we want this, this energy to, to have legs, if you will. And one of the things I've been doing for the last four years is running an educational podcast. And so the idea came to me again, because I don't, I'm not classically trained in trauma or psychology or neuroscience. One of my best friends on this panel is trained in neuroscience. So um, I'll give her that and you're gonna hear from her in a minute. But what I did think we could do is put together a, a series, a podcast series that we could then um, have the ability to get out to a wider audience. And I'm really curious, we're not gonna have time to go through that go through it today, but I'm really curious what your thinking is on that. Um, are there, um, are these the right topics? First of all, is it the right thing to do? Are these the right topics? Are we missing anything? And uh, I would just love to hear your input. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. So Jeff really provides quite a wonderful resource, not only his mind, but also his podcasts. And it's, it's just been a joy to, to work with Jeff. Uh, particularly these last three or four months. And so now we'll turn to Melissa, Dr. Hughes out of Florida, uh, who is a neuroscience researcher. So you, Melissa. Doctor. I'm Melissa Hughes and I am the Florida program director for Give Something Back. Give Something Back was established back in 2003. Since then, we've grown and evolved, but our dedication to helping students chart a path to post-secondary success has remained constant. And our scholars come from families below the poverty threshold and are often the first in their families to attend a university, community college, or even trade school. We prioritize students who have experienced heightened social risks such as foster care, homelessness, or the incarceration of a parent. And one of the things that we know about the students with whom we work is that often their needs go beyond academic support because the obstacles they have faced and the trauma they've experienced have a significant impact on their neural development. Neuroscience has really advanced to enable us to see the impact of trauma on the brain and understand how it physically and chemically changes it, affecting everything from cell structure to emotional control, learning, and the ability to form relationships. And we incorporate this science into a robust mentorship curriculum to support the whole child, not just the student. The body of research on adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, is expansive. And we know that in addition to the way that it impacts students academically, childhood traumas can have a lasting effect on health into adulthood. Studies show a direct correlation with the number of adverse childhood experiences and the risk for negative health issues, 
poor lifestyle behaviors such as substance abuse and alcoholism, and overall life potential influenced by graduation and post-secondary opportunities. We are really grateful to participate in this important discussion about how to truly meet kids where they are from a neurological perspective and provide the kinds of resources they need to be successful in school and in life. Given the growing body of knowledge about the brain and those factors that impact how it functions, it is essential to incorporate this science into improving the way we serve this next generation. Primitive parts that interfere with cognition and decision making and making wise decisions, then you need to really learn about it because it'll make a difference in your perspective on kids, on yourself, on self-care, on your colleagues. And it's really a critical part of moving forward. So part of our vision is that, in fact, educators, administrators, school staff will know about the brains. They'll be taught about neuroscience as part of what they're doing at the undergraduate level or in pre-service as you're becoming, uh, being prepared to be an administrator in graduate courses even. If it doesn't happen there, then it needs to happen in professional development, in communities, in schools. So, uh, Melissa, thank you so much for sharing. So, we've just got a couple things left. We have two interns who've been with us, uh, recent graduates or, or current students, graduate students, uh, in the U.S. and Canada. And so, quickly, Katie, any thoughts about the stress that college students are facing, young professionals are facing? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Katie. And I think the struggle that we all have faced in grad school is just burnout with this pandemic. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that this past year and a half has been very difficult. And for administrators and teachers to acknowledge that too amongst their students. Um, I also believe in high school, elementary school, secondary school, that it's really important for school districts to support the teachers and equip them um, to address these adversities that all students are facing now and have faced prior to the pandemic. Um, and I really believe that promoting mental health in amongst every level of school and college, graduate school, all of that is the best way to support the students. So Katie, thank you so much. And uh, Andrea, what about you? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I just wanna all thank you all for your determination and willingness. Um, to improve the educational system. Um, Katie said, you know, quite a lot. So I'll just kind of summarize. Um, I do strongly believe that change needs to be made in our school and the suicide and NSSI rates are increasing despite a greater mental health awareness, indicating that there is an educational link that's missing in our countries. And I do believe that schools must do more for current students and future generations to ensure that their time in the school is spent in a safe and supportive environment that encourages emotional awareness and will lead to successful cognitive and social development and academic and life success. Thank you, Andrea. And I just want to say, you know, I hope you have time to really think about what's been said today. What we're doing with the Coalition for Future of Education is looking at visioning, trying to help districts and communities imagine a different future, a better future. And that involves listening to youth. We believe it's their future. They have a right to be heard. And as you do your planning, they should be part of the planning team. They should be engaged. They should be part of the visioning that goes on. We also believe that, you know, you can find out a lot with visioning by thinking about these exemplars, like the ones we've seen and heard from today. So you don't have to start from scratch. <laughs> You can certainly get the input from your stakeholders, but then go out and find examples of what's working, good evidence-based practices, find something that resonates with your school, with your community. And then we encourage people to dream. Think big, think long-term. What will be sustainable? What will last when the next pandemic comes? Hopefully there won't be one. However, what do we do to build more resiliency? And what do we do so that people have a better understanding of compassion and the really, really important role that plays in all of our lives? You know, it's hard to be compassionate to others if you first don't have self-compassion. 
So how can you be kind to yourself? How can you do the self-care that's needed? Even when you have all the stressors and all the responsibilities, which we know as educators and as leaders we have, be kind to yourself. Take those deep breaths, go for a walk, right? But then also look at the self-care of your staff and then do what you can so students will get a consistent message year after year. You know, we have a kind of a captive audience. When it comes to trauma, there's a lot that can be done at the community level. Certainly we need to be working with families. We need to support um, justice and work towards equity. Need to help remove hunger and food scarcity. We need to help people in poverty. But in schools, we have almost a captive audience where in fact, we can make a huge difference in our students' life. And as their lives improve, their lives of their families are more likely to improve too. So again, I wanna thank everyone today. What a fabulous team. And we will be sending slides out so you'll get some of the details that you might've missed. Um, again, we so appreciate the words of wisdom from all of you.